Hello, everyone. If you like what I'm doing here, please consider subscribing, liking, and commenting. It would really help the channel out quite a bit. Thank you very much. CBS presents Intrigue, Tales of Espionage, Manhunt, and High Adventure. Good evening. This is Joseph Schilfraub. Your guide tonight on this last of our summer excursions into the land of intrigue. The central figure of our drama is a man whose name was for more than half a century a touchstone of power and mystery in European affairs. Sir Basil Zaharoff, the greatest conspirator of them all. Whence he came, what was the source of his power, no man knew. Yet he led Europe's rulers into a maze of diplomatic skullduggery and international duplicity that ended in two great world wars. Come now, on this most strange and sinister journey into the land of intrigue. <laughs> Joseph Schildkraut stars as Sir Basil Zaharoff, the mystery man of Europe, as CBS brings you Satan Was a Salesman. Like a tale out of the Arabian Nights, it begins in the teeming bizarre lime streets of an Oriental city. Our hero moves among beggars, but he is tall and well-made, and his blonde hair stands out like a banner of revolt against the mean and swarthy aspect of his fellows. He walks with a firm and arrogant stride, a little red fez cocked at a rakish angle on his handsome head. And on this day, he is to be seen turning in at the gate of a fine mansion in Constantinople's International Settlement. Eighteen sixty-nine, dear Anthony, this, this will introduce Basil Zaharoff, an expert on Balkan diplomacy, and a young man of rare and unique attainments. It occurred to me that you might find him useful in some of your enterprises. If not, I think you'll at least find him amusing to talk to, faithfully, as the are at. So, you're an expert on Balkan diplomacy, eh, Basil? Yes, Monsieur Anthony. How old are you? Eighteen, sir. Zaharoff? Your Greek? Yes, sir. Basileos Zaharias is my real name, sir. Oh. <laughs> All ready for the Russian invasion, aren't you? <laughs> yes, sir. Isn't that rather a drastic precaution? Well, sir, for instance, if I'm a Greek with a Russian name, people who don't like Greeks can say, well, he's not really a Greek. <laughs> and people who don't like Russians can say, well, he's not really a Russian. <laughs> <laughs> That's an ingenious idea. Yes, I thought so, too, sir. I have an important advantage which has cost me nothing, simply by changing my name. <laughs> <laughs> You're priceless, Basil. Absolutely priceless. <laughs> <laughs> you should know that every man has his price, Monsieur Antonides. Hmm? Why, I special? Well, you live in a very fine house here in Constantinople, Monsieur Antonides. What are you driving at? Nothing, sir. I merely notice what a fine house you live in, and yet you are merely the correspondent for a newspaper in Athens. Why, you insolent? Yes? I should have you thrown out of here. But you won't, Monsieur Antonides. You won't. You know that I could sell my ideas about you to the Turkish secret police. Yes. You're very clever, Basil. But I don't think you have anything to tell about me except your vague suspicions. Who sent me to you, Monsieur Antonides? Well, The I... British ex consul. I ask myself, why are you and he such great friends? You obviously have nothing in common. Then I ask myself, why did he send me to you? In his eyes, I am a criminal, a petty thief, and a confidence man of the bazaar. I don't think he's far wrong. That 
is a mistake, sir. Crime is only a means to an end, Monsieur Antonidas. No intelligent man would make a career of it. But a man who knew his way around the underworld of Constantinople could be very useful indeed uh, to a spy, for instance. What's your proposition, Michael? Well, sir, I spend a good deal of my time around the waterfront where I pick up jobs as a tourist guide. Now, most of the ship captains know me. I do business with some of them on a commission basis. Now, if a man had something he wanted to send from Constantinople to Athens, for instance, and didn't want to risk sending it in the usual way... (laughs) (laughs) I think you and I can do business. Europe in the 1870s. Russia and Turkey, the two great remaining powers of feudalism, locked in a death struggle. And little Greece, bridged between Asia and Europe, caught between them in a precarious neutrality. In Athens, a new political figure has appeared upon the scene. His name is Antonidas, and his secretary is a young man named Basil Zaharoff. No longer does young Zaharoff sport a jaunty red fez. His clothes are made by an English tailor, and he's quite a young man about town. But he still visits the waterfront from time to time. And one evening in the year 1877, in a bar at Piraeus, the port of Athens... Well, this is my last voyage, lad. They are tiring me. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Captain Lindstrom. There's a little job I've been doing on the side... Not much money in it, but I thought I might throw it your way now that I'm going home to Sweden for good. But I suppose you'd be too busy with your politics to consider it. Mm, well, what kind of a job is it? Well, as you know, there are a number of sidelines to being a ship captain in this part of the world. Among other things, I have been acting as one of the agents for Nordenfeld. The Swedish munition firm. Oh, well, there ought to be good money in that. <laughs> in Russia or Turkey, perhaps. Greece has never been one of our big customers. And now that both the warring powers have guaranteed Greek neutrality... Uh, how much does the job pay, Captain Lindstrom? Only five pounds sterling a week. But it's not difficult. Yes. All you have to do is drop around to the war office in Athens once in a while and see if there's anything they want in the way of rifle. Mm-hmm. Once in a while, they order a small cannon or a howitzer for a uh, <clears throat> parade. <laughs> Five pounds sterling will buy quite a lot of Greek money at the present rate of exchange. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> but, of course, if you're too busy with your political work for Antonin... Not then... at all, Captain, not at all. As a matter of fact, I think guns and politics would make a splendid combination. <laughs> Yes, I remember meeting you now, Zero, at Antonidas' house the night I became Minister of War. Yes, Your Excellency. I was his agent in Constantinople for several years. So you were responsible for that brilliant work. Well, sir, I have no intentions of deprecating Antonidas. As a matter of fact, sir, I have come with a message from Monsieur Antonidas, a message of most urgent and uh, confidential nature. Yes? What is it? Great neutrality, sir, is on the point of being violated. What's the source of Antonidas' information? I am. <laughs> you bring me a message from Antonidas based on information furnished by you? <laughs> That's marvelous. Your Excellency, I have it from no less an authority than Mr. Norden, felt the head of the firm I represent, that guns purchased from Krupp with Russian money have been shipped to into Bulgaria and I at this very moment being moved up to our northern frontier. This is a disaster. How many guns are there? Oh, I have a list of them right here, sir. This is true. Greece is finished. We cannot hope to match a battery like this. There's one way it might be accomplished, sir. How? It would take weeks to get a shipment here. There's a ship lying offshore outside the harbor at this moment awaiting my orders. 
It's carrying a cargo of guns and artillery that would more than match the new Bulgarian batteries. Yes. But, alas, the shipment says consigned to the Turkish army. Did you say this ship is awaiting your orders? That's correct. Then order it into the harbor. In the Greek, it is your duty to let us have those guns. Why, it might cost me my job. How much does Nordenfeld pay you? Five pounds sterling a week. Is the price of your patriotism five pounds sterling a week? No, I was thinking of a somewhat larger sum. And that is? A thousand pounds sterling in cash. Young man, you'll come to a bad end. Yes, that may be, Your Excellency. That may be, but somehow or other, <laughs> I must make a beginning. <laughs> you use my name to extort money from the government? Well, I had intended to split this money with you, Mr. Antonides, but since you feel this way about it... Oh, you think you're very clever. A thousand pound bribe, a few thousand commission, but you killed the goose that laid your golden eggs a horror. You're finished. You hear me? Finished. Very good. That suits me very well, Mr. Antonides. I'm leaving Athens anyway. Hmm? Goodbye. I'm taking a train for Sofia tonight. Oh. Now, I suppose you're going to try to sell a bigger shipment of guns to Bulgaria by showing them the receipts from the Greek shipment. I'd be a fool if I didn't. Oh, it'll be another few thousand, but there it ends. When you're found out, your name will be poisoned in both countries. Then where will you go? To Russia, sir, to Russia, to collect my bonus for having diverted that shipment from Turkey to Greece. This is a dangerous game you're playing. Greek neutrality is already in a delicate balance. A few maneuvers like this might be all it would take to plunge us into this war. I'll let you politicians make the wars. I'll furnish the guns. Oh, have you not one spark of patriotism? Why, certainly, sir. I will always be willing to sell Greece as many guns as she can pay for. <laughs> Welcome to Stockholm. Congratulations on those magnificent sales to Greece and Bulgaria. Thank you, sir. Tell me, how did you manage it? Oh, uh, I studied some of the principles of salesmanship, Mr. Norton. Indeed, you must have. I don't mind telling you I consider you our most valuable salesman at the present time. Thank you, sir. I am even considering granting you a rise in salary, oh. say, to ten pounds a week. Oh, well, that is most generous of you, Mr. Norton. And I'm giving you a chance to triple that. If you succeed in the new mission, I have in mind for you. Yes, what is that, sir? I am sending you to Paris on a job of a most confidential nature. Briefly, this is the problem. Yes. Some mysterious personage has been cornering Nordenfeld's stock through some rather unethical maneuvering on the bush. Mm. I want to find out who that man is. And when you find out... I don't know what I shall do, but unless we put a stop to his operations, I shall wake up some morning and find myself with a new partner. This firm has always been in the Nordenfeld family, Monsieur Zahara. It would be a terrible blow to me and to Sweden. Should it fall into the hands of foreign speculators? I am sorry you take this narrow view of it, Mr. Nordenfeld. Eh? What's that, Zaharov? The man who's been buying your stocks in Paris, your new partner, sir, is myself. You? You're joking, of course. No, 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 Mr. Norton, not at all. I'm your new business partner. Congratulations. I'm glad. Whom are you acting as agent for? Basil Zaharov. That's ridiculous. How on earth could you manage to raise all that money? Now, look, there's no reason we shouldn't know each other's secrets now that we are partners, Mr. Nordenfeld. The checks for the Bulgarian orders were made out in my name, at the insistence of the Bulgarian minister, of course, sir, and deposited in my personal account in Paris. You embezzled... No, 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 no. I borrowed it for a few days only, bought Nordenfeld stock, forced it up, and borrowed against the stock I hold to repay the loan. Sir, you will find my accounts with you accurate to the penny. Of all the dishonest reprimands... Now, 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 Mr. Nordenfeld, Mr. Nordenfeld, if we are to be partners, we had better be friends. If you show a cooperative spirit, you will have no cause to regret our association. Now then, to begin with, sir, our production must be greatly increased. Austria-Hungary is arming as fast as she can, and we must be able to supply her. 
As soon as we have completed the reorganization of our company, sir, I am leaving for Vienna to close our deal with the Austro-Hungarian government. Not so fast, Zaharov. You've made a very clever beginning, but selling to a great empire is not quite the same as selling to little Balkan countries. The great powers will buy only the newest contrivances, the most up to date weapons. Quite, sir, quite. We will supply them. I'm not so sure we can. There's a man in Vienna now, an American, named Hiram Maxim. Maxim? He has invented a new weapon which he calls a machine gun. Machine gun. A gun that will fire several hundred shots a minute. He holds a patent on the device, and my experts tell me it cannot be made without his patent. Uh, has he demonstrated this gun yet? He will give a demonstration of it before the Emperor Franz Joseph next week. Very good. I'd better leave for Vienna tonight. Oh, it's quite hopeless. You can't hope to compete with Maxim. Uh, Mr. Nordenfeld, we have a saying in the Levant. If you want to destroy a man, <laughs> first make him your partner. An astounding invention, Mr. Maxim? Yes, this certainly beats anything Nordenfeld has shown us, Mr. Zahara. Your Majesty, it fires rapidly, but you can't win a war with one gun. How many of these can you deliver, Mr. Maxim? Well, Your Majesty, I'd have to take some time. Mm, yes, to... yes, precisely, Your Majesty, precisely. A weapon like this, sir, with hundreds of precision parts put together with the art of a jeweler. Uh, Mr. Maxim, how long did it take you to construct this one model? Well, three years. Yes, but yes, it... yes, thank you. Just as I thought, just as I thought. You see, Your Majesty, brilliant as Mr. Maxim's invention is, it's thoroughly impractical, I'm afraid, to manufacture in sufficient quantities to equip a great army such as yours, Your Majesty. Why, it simply couldn't be done. Now, look here, Mr. Zahar. There's uh, something in what Mr. Zaharoff says, Father. Yes. Yes, I never thought of that. It is a fascinating toy, Mr. Maxim, but I'm afraid that's all it ever will be. Good day. Your Majesty. Good day. Your Majesty. Better luck next time, Maxim. Next time? You realize that I invested my life savings in that demonstration today? I haven't even got the fare back to the States. Oh. I'm sorry. If there's anything I can do, I'd be very happy to advance you a small amount for the steamship fare. Second class? Oh, I'll just bet you would. Now, I'm not taking any of your charity, see? I'm going to stay here and fight. Uh, supposing you succeed in getting an order for your machine guns, where will you get the capital to build a factory? Mm, if I can show an order for a hundred or more, any bank in Europe will finance me, and you know it. Why be content with a hundred? If Austria orders a hundred, England will order a thousand, Germany will order five thousand, and France will order ten thousand. The race will be on. But you haven't even a plan. It will be a year at least before you can get into production. Uh, I'd rather not make too many of them anyway. Good heavens, man. Are you completely mad? Yeah, would be madness to use a weapon like this on such a large scale. Casualties on both sides would be unthinkable. It's the business of statesmen to worry about casualties. You and I merely furnish the guns. If they're stupid enough to kill each other off with them, <laughs> it's none of our affair. Sorry, I can't see it that way. Look at it this way. With this invention, you can buy into every armament firm in Europe, Maxim. In a position like that, you could exercise influence over the governments. You could certainly control the production of arms. But I'm not an international financier. I'm only an inventor, an I engineer. I could make you the most... Powerful man in Europe overnight. No, that's a crazy way to talk. It would be easy. Come now, come now, Maxim. Listen, as competitors, we only do each other harm. Why not be partners? Oh, what's in it for me? Oh, a full partnership in Nordenfeld. But I thought you were just a salesman. Yes, I am. And that's why I can offer you with confidence a full partnership in Nordenfeld of Sweden. No strings attached, you understand. It will be Maxim and Nordenfeld tomorrow. Your name first. Well, Maxim, how about it? All right, Zaharoff. Let's be partners. <laughs> want to destroy a man, first make him your partner. With the formation of the new armaments firm of Maxim and Nordenfeld, it was announced today Mr. Nordenfeld, the founder of the firm, would retire from active participation in the business. 
Mr. Nordenfeld's duties will be taken over by a newcomer, Mr. Basil Sahara. The firm of Maxim and Nordenfeld today merged with the British armaments firm of Dickers Limited. It was announced that Mr. Maxim would retire from active participation in the business. Mr. Maxim's duties will be taken over by Mr. Basil Zaharo. Upon the merger of the firm of Armstrong and Brown with Vickers Limited, it was announced that Mr. Albert Vickers would retire from active participation in the business. Mr. Vickers' duties will be taken over by Mr. Basil Zaharo. Excuse me, mademoiselle, is this place taken? Why, no, monsieur. Won't you join me? Thank you. I thought perhaps you were waiting for your husband. My husband never travels with me. Oh, if I were in his place, mademoiselle, you would never travel alone. You're very gallant, monsieur. Zaharov. Not the fabulous monsieur Zaharov. Am I that fabulous? Oh, and mysterious, too, so the newspapers say. Afraid in this case, madame, you are the mysterious one. Oh, I'm sorry. I am Maria Duquesa de Villafranca de los Caballeros. Your Highness, I am deeply honored. It's a pity that I meet you while I'm yet a commoner. Oh, you expect to receive a title? Well, after all, madame, I can't marry you without some sort of title. But, monsieur, you've only just met me. Yes, I know. I'm very good at snap judgments. I've never made a mistake. Never made a mistake? No. Why, you're not even human. <laughs> Some people insist that I actually am the incarnation of Satan. <laughs> Tell me, monsieur, is it true that you go around stirring up wars and creating troubles among the nations in order to sell guns oh, to them. what nonsense. I'm merely a salesman, a simple salesman. I'll take this trip, for instance. I'm on my way to Greece, my home, by the way. I have here with me the plans for a submarine, a boat, madame, that will sail under the water. You intend to sell the submarines only to Greece? Or to all the nations? I can't help myself. You see, Greece will buy two because I will tell them Turkey already has one. Turkey will buy four because Greece has two. Russia will buy ten because Turkey has four. And Germany will buy a whole fleet because of Russia. Britain will buy a bigger fleet because of Germany. And so it goes. Mana, am I to blame for the stupidity of nations? You know, there is something rather satanic about you. Those cold gray eyes. And that little pointed goatee. Uh, could I tempt you, Your Highness? <laughs> Perhaps. In the meantime, please remember that I am a married woman. Yes, and I am still a commoner. <laughs> Five thousand guns. Two hundred and forty thousand machine guns. Four million rifles. Two hundred fifty eight thousand high explosive shells. Three million one hundred ninety thousand one hundred thirty five British casualties. Such were the services of Basil Zaharoff to the British Empire in the First World War. And his reward? Basil Zaharoff, for extraordinary services to the Empire in time of war, and for assistance in the preparation of our peacetime defenses. I dub the Knight Grand Cross of the British Empire. Arise, Sir Basil. And so the little street urchin of Constantinople became a great prince and lived with the princess in blissful happiness in their castle on the River Waz. If death had not claimed the princess, they might have lived happily ever after. And there might have been no World War II. But before many years had passed, the goat-bearded gentleman with a satanic face once more appeared in the capitals of Europe. And the very sight of him struck terror to the hearts of well-meaning statesmen. 
Once more, the name of Basil Zaharoff began to make news. March 15th, 1920. A new banking syndicate has been formed in Greece with Sir Basil Zaharoff as its director. As Sir Basil arrived in Athens, the Greek army was mobilizing for an offensive against Turkey. Sir Basil Zaharoff, warmaker extraordinary, has done it again. Following a Zaharoff financial agreement with the House of Mitsubishi, the Japanese army is concentrating troops in Korea in preparation for an onslaught on the Chinese province of Manchuria. Sir Basil Zaharoff arrived in Rome today on the eve of Signor Mussolini's declaration of war against Ethiopia. One of the notable Europeans venturing in Spanish Morocco this season is Sir Basil Zaharoff. General Francisco Franco, leader of the insurgent forces against the Spanish Republic, give a banquet in his honor. He had the stage set for his second great war. But he was not to live to see it through. In 1936, socialites arriving early for the season in Monte Carlo noticed a petulant old man in a wheelchair being trundled about the grounds of the Hotel de Paris. Only a few realized that he owned the casino in which they had come to gamble and was the undisputed dictator of the soil upon which they trod. An ill-tempered old man, bundled up in an overcoat, a heavy steamer rug across his knees, shivering in the midsummer weather, wincing at the balmy breezes that wafted gently in from the warm Mediterranean across the Bay of Monaco. Seems to me the, the winters are not so warm here as they used to be. Yes, Sir Basil, look. Look at those fools rushing up to the casino to lose their money. <laughs> Why don't they save it and invest it? They should do that, shouldn't they, Henri? Yes, Sir Basil. Uh, they don't even know that I own the casino. <laughs> yes, I fool them all, don't I, Henri? Yes, Sir Basil. You know, Henri, you're such a close mouth. I'm going to tell you why I bought this ridiculous principality of Monte Carlo. The papers said I bought it for a plaything. Idiots. Don't they realize I had to do something like this? Now I'm so old I can't get around anymore. Now those kings and queens and idiotic prime ministers have to come to me. And when they lose their fortunes at the gaming tables, I make their losses good for them, and they make my losses good for me. You see, Henri, when they get home again, they always get their war ministers to send me a nice, fat order. Your employer is a pretty foxy old gentleman, eh, Henry? Yes, Sir Basil. Yes, Sir Basil. Yes, Sir Basil. Yes, Sir Basil. Hey, did you send that letter I told you off to Barancourt? Yes, Sir Basil. Listen, I want to be placed in the tomb right beside the Duchess. You'll remember that? Yes, Sir Basil. And make sure the steam heating is in operation at all times. If I can't get warm in this accursed cold climate, I'm forced to live in at least I shall be warm in my tomb, eh, Henri? Yes, Sir Basil. <laughs> I'm getting... It's getting shady here. Henri, wheel me over there in the sun by that rose bush. <laughs> I was always fond of roses. I'm cold. Yes, sir, Basil. Yes, sir, Basil. Yes, sir, Basil. Yes, sir, Basil. Can't anyone anywhere say anything to me but yes, sir, Basil. Yes, sir, Basil. It is a gray November day in the year 1936. The Chateau de Balancourt, near Bontoise in France. A long black car decked with funeral plumes moves slowly up the long, winding road. In the funeral car, in a severely plain ebony box, lie the mortal remains of the master of Balancourt, Sir Basil Zaharoff. 
Knight, Grand Cross of the British Empire. Knight, Grand Cross of the Bath. Grand Cross of the Legion of Honor. Member of the Order of Franz Joseph. Recipient of the Kaiser Wilhelm Medal. Grandee of Spain. Greek Order of the Savior. Order of the Ottoman Empire. And Regent of Monte Carlo. At the door of the chapel on the estate grounds at Balancourt, the funeral car draws to a halt, and a company of liveried servants lift the ebony box and carry it to its final resting place. Thus, without ceremony and without fanfare, with no mourners save his secretarial staff and household servants, the man who dominated Europe through the crucial years of two centuries is laid away in his final resting place. Well, that's done. There's only one thing that still puzzles me. What's that? His wanting a steam-heated tomb. He won't need any heat where he's going. Out your guide tonight on our final journey into the land of intrigue. I hope you have enjoyed these summer excursions as much as I've enjoyed acting as your guide. I wish to thank Frank Graham, the narrator on tonight's show, also Tom Collins, Lou Merrill, Anne Stone, Jay Novello, Pat McGeehan, Alec Harper, George Neese, Norman Field, and James Matthews, who have been more or less regular members of our company. For the words of Robert Tallman and the music of Lut Gluston, my thanks for a job well done. To Charles Vanda, a great bouquet for his production guidance. Good night, and goodbye for now. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>